Many of the speakers uh, <coughs> for the township meeting this evening in favor of uh, Steve and Rick making a presentation. We've asked them to come and give us a brief and an update on what's going on. Now, we all know what happened with uh, the uh, buying and lawsuit. So let's give Steve and Rick a chance to give us an update on what's going on because that's what we asked them for. I don't know how many, there's a lot of new faces in here that I don't think live in Will Township, but you are welcome. So we hope that we'll have a good meeting. And uh, we have questions and answers to follow, but I don't want to be here till midnight. So, with that, Rick, Steve. Yeah, I can go. Thank you, and thank you for allowing the opportunity to uh, go over the uh, project. Uh, I just wanted to give everyone an update on where we are at with the project. Uh, we're currently in tier two of the study, um, and so this presentation that I'm actually giving tonight is uh, a really fresh presentation. I'll go over where we're at with the tier two portion of the study, which is really the alternatives to be carried forward phase. And so that's where we get into um, ultimately, and it's going to be really complicated, so it's, it's kind of a, a long presentation, but you know, there, what we did was we kind of uh, made like 12 different sections within the whole corridor, and we're advancing uh, certain sections will have two or three different alignments being advanced forward. Um, and so we wanted to, the, tonight I wanted to kind of go over just uh, just what we, we have, the latest and greatest of uh, the alternatives that we're advancing forward. So I'll go over that in a second. But I wanted to, so tonight we'll do the project status, the recap of recent meetings, the alternatives to be carried forward, because that's a bulk of this presentation, the next steps, and then open uh, for Q&A. So for the project status, uh, we did complete Tier 1 in January 2013, um, and we are currently in the middle of Tier 2, and that's the detailed study. So Tier 1 was the broad level of analysis, um, looking at well over 100 different corridors throughout this uh, 950 square mile area, um, eventually uh, getting to a B3 corridor that was selected to be advanced forward into Tier 2. D tier 2 is the detailed engineering. It involves all of the environmental survey, the engineers, the hydraulics, the so the, the drainage uh, is being looked at as part of this tier. Um, overpass and underpass locations are being looked at as part of this tier. And then interchange locations. <coughs> so where are we at in Tier 2? Uh, we're getting towards the end of Tier 2. We have the... Um, we held the one-on-one -on -one meetings, a, a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings. I'll get to the stats in a little bit here, but in, in January, February, we held the landowner meetings with uh, all of our 850 uh, landowners uh, throughout the 850 attended those landowner meetings. Uh, we held uh, corridor planning groups and technical task force. We've held uh, two pairs of public meetings. Um, we, we're anticipating one more corridor planning group, and then uh, the uh, uh, public hearing in the fall of this year um, and so what happened in tier one was we presented a draft environmental impact statement in that draft environmental impact statement we had three corridors that were advanced forward this was during tier one um, those three corridors were known as A3S2 which was a northern corridor that went north of the airport and then kind of south avoided uh, went south of Cedar Lake we had the B3 corridor, which was the selected corridor, and then we had B4. So tonight what I'm presenting is the alternatives within the B3 corridor that we're recommending right now to be advanced forward. We have a little bit more work on some of them um, as far as the uh, alignments, and we're still waiting for a little bit more field data. Um, and then eventually that all gets wrapped up in the draft environmental impact statement. Um, within the next... Uh, probably a couple weeks, we hope to release the Alternatives We Carry Forward memo. It's well over, it's probably about 100 pages at this point. Yeah, more than that. There. Well, with all the appendices and everything. With all the appendices, it's probably at about 150 page read. Um, as far as just going over the interchanges, everything as far as the alignments being advanced forward. Now, what we're recommending to be advanced forward then gets detailed, in, in great detail, in the draft environmental impact statement. Um, so just like in Tier 1, where we carried A3, S2, B3, and B4 into the entire document. So in Tier 1, it was about a 600-page or so document, and it went into the secondary and cumulative impacts, it went into water resource impacts, it went into, into uh, 
uh, um, really a, the, the environmental impact statement is just a, it's a lot of chapters and a lot of impacts. So what is being advanced for now is going to be studied all into great detail and all presented at the hearing this fall. Hopefully that makes sense. So just to, to reiterate, uh, why does this region need a new facility? Um, what we show is that this is a, really a vital national link um, in, in really the whole uh, nation and with increased pressures from intermodal um, development from the north along the I-80 corridor, um, we show that a, uh, a, a new facility, a new route uh, is needed in this study area to connect I-55 to I-65. <coughs> So the purpose and need, um, it's very similar to Tier 1 with some slight modifications, just improving regional mobility, alleviate local system congestion, and improve local system mobility, and provide for efficient movement of freight. So just to recap some of the meetings, Tier 1, uh, overall for Tier 1, uh, we held six public meetings, two public hearings. 10 corridor planning groups and over 9,000 newsletters were distributed. We had over 130 one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings or small group meetings. In tier one, we looked at 80 different alternatives into looking at uh, some included widening existing roads, um, looked at different modes, uh, ultimately um, dismissing all of them except for the B3 corridor. When we looked in tier one, you know, the A3S2 corridor was more northern. Um, they had a lot of similar travel performance, as we did show uh, over 60% of the, the traffic on this route is through route, uh, it's a, a through corridor. Um, so what we were seeing was we were seeing a lot of impacts on the more northern alignments. Um, one of the areas that was very difficult to get through was the St. John area that is very developed um, at this point, so we saw substantial housing impacts. Uh, during Tier 1. Uh, there was no other areas north of the airport where we would be impacting uh, Plum Grove Nature Preserve. Uh, we also have Governor State University, which we're running to the south of. Um, and there was a lot of other areas with Manhattan, just to the south of there with all their pipelines, ultimately through this area. Also, if we went north, we would be impacting Rock Run Preserve. If we went straight, we'd be impacting Treat Island and a number of residents uh, along the I-55 corridor. So ultimately, B3 in the more central section was selected. Uh, this was because it did provide a balance. It had similar travel performance as a more northern corridor, uh, and it showed um, a little less impacts as far as uh, areas such as Treat Island, Governor State University, uh, some nature preserves. There was a little less housing impacts. Um, uh, the southern portion, or the southern corridor, we did study several corridors to the south. Um, those would uh, continue to travel along I-55, um, impact Kankakee State Park. Um, we saw a substantial drop in traffic um, as you ended up chasing I-55, so you saw a lot of adverse travel. Um, so ultimately the more southern uh, portion ones were dismissed as well. So in January, uh, the federal uh, FHWA, which is the, the uh, Federal Highway Administration approved the B3, the no action alternative, be advanced into Tier 2, uh, which had the least, out of all of them, the least environmental impacts. It had a higher travel performance than some of the southern routes. It actually did have very similar uh, travel performance to some of the more northern routes. Um, and uh, the greater stakeholder support for the B3 corridor um, versus some of the more northern ones. Uh, is, uh, and then lower construction costs. So in tier two, we focus on that B3 corridor. We come up with a series of alternatives within that corridor. It was a 2,000 foot corridor that was approved in tier one. In tier two, we're looking at approximately a 400 to 500 foot uh, footprint. Um, what we're running into right now is, uh, for example, drainage. We're looking at how exactly we're gonna drain this thing. So we're gonna need pretty, it's pretty flat you may know in this area, so we're running into some pretty big ditch sections in order to drain uh, the roadway. Um, but uh, right now we have uh, a lot of the surveys complete for uh, ground. Uh, we have recently had one of six meetings, which is uh, for historic and cultural um, significant uh, properties. 
Um, we've, we've done a little geotechnical. Um, there's more geotechnical planned probably for later this year, in the fall. Um, we've done interchange types, <laughs> uh, land use assessments, crossroad connectivities, alignment studies. Um, we've done a lot of uh, utility uh, investigations as well. Um, and then land acquisition uh, studies are ongoing as far as uh, continuing to look at if there's landlocked parcels, access roads, stuff like that. In Tier 2, we've held over 45 one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings, and uh, we've talked to about 406 parcel owners uh, uh, within the corridor. Now, the number of meetings with emergency services, townships, uh, municipalities, uh, forest preserve districts, uh, and a lot of people. Uh, so what did we hear? Uh, a lot of concerns over the interchange locations, uh, roads that are being kept open, um, swapping of roads that kept uh, to be kept open locations, um, and then frontage roads and relocating roads. Uh, so we, we've actually gotten a lot, a lot of feedback uh, even recently. The beginning of Tier 1 or Tier 2, uh, we held those five landowner meetings, over 850 people attended. We got a lot of um, good data. Uh, as far as trying to come up with the least impact of alignment within that 2000 foot corridor. Um, we also set up a series of landowner relations representatives along the corridor so that people can be, answer their questions quickly. Um, I know that we still have some outstanding questions, uh, so, but we, we have answered well over 150 or so out of the 200 uh, some of questions that we have. So we still do have some outstanding. But it, from what we understand, it has been working pretty well um, as far as just trying to come up with a, a, a quick point of contact for everybody who's located within the corridor. Um, there's other opportunities uh, I, uh, for those that are outside the corridor. They can always go to the website, submit questions, um, and I do come out often to, to speak to groups. So I just wanted to recap the recent meetings real quick. We held a corridor planning group meeting in May of 2013. This is uh, the third planning group meeting. Um, we discussed the alternatives we carried forward. There was a, a lot of uh, discussion on the road connectivity, uh, interchange locations, and sustainable, uh, uh, BM, sustainable practices that we're implementing on this corridor. We'll get into those uh, later on in this presentation. Public meeting number two, we held one in Illinois, one in Indiana, over 500 total attendees. Uh, we we, we uh, discussed the, uh, really the road connectivities that we were thinking of, um, the mainline interchange alternatives that we were looking at. Since that public meeting, we've made uh, a number of revisions again, and I'll go over some of those tonight uh, based on the feedback of those meetings. Uh, we held environmental field reviews, and actually a lot of this PowerPoint was actually just uh, presented to a lot of the environmental regulatory agencies. Uh, we meet regularly with uh, US EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife Services, IDNR, IDEM, uh, which is Illinois Department of Natural Resources, then you have Indiana Department of Natural Resources. There's about 13 some odd different uh, regulatory agencies that are in charge of, of some type of fashion uh, with this job. You know, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers would be in charge of wetlands, water bodies, fish and wildlife services would be in charge of what's called Section 7, which is threatened and endangered species. Um, and so those agencies, we meet with them regularly on this project. A lot of this PowerPoint was taken from a meeting we just had with them earlier today. Um, and so we actually held a couple environmental field reviews. Um, we actually created uh, numerous uh, different alternatives to, to uh, try to better avoid some of the sensitive areas after looking at the wetland delineation reports, for example. Um, so we have uh, more new alignments. Uh, the 106 reviews, we just held two meetings. Uh, we went well outside the uh, APE, which is the um, what is APs? area of potential effect. Area of potential effect. And so in Indiana, they, uh, they went a mile outside the 2,000 foot corridor. Uh, we we followed suit, um, so we uh, photographed well over. It was well over like 80, 800 uh, in, in both states, like almost 600 in Illinois alone. It was yeah about 600 homes in Illinois determining their potential eligibility. Um, normal in, in, in we we've never gone that far in Illinois, uh, but uh, after Tier One, we've reached a programmatic agreement with the 
State Historic Preservation Office of both states to agree to a one mile uh, uh, <coughs> radius. So what we found in Indiana was one listed and one was eligible. In Illinois, there was three listed and seven were eligible that we found within that, that radius. Um, so recommended alternatives be carried forward at the public meeting. Uh, we discussed, and one of the things that we're carrying through is just a tolling alternative. Uh, we did are, are recommending to dismiss the non-toll alternative, um, and, and so that's, we didn't get a lot of comments on that one, but we're, we're looking to dismiss the non-toll alternative and uh, just carry forward the tolling alternative. Uh, for the B3 alignments, and this part of the presentation we start getting into a lot of the alignments. So in tier one we had a working alignment footprint that was given at the hearing. In tier two we're starting to utilize more of the field data that we got, uh, cross sections, detailed cross sections, uh, footprints for mainline and crossroads. Um, a lot of crossroads that were assumed uh, in, in tier one, uh, we've added a lot more, um, quite a bit more of crossroads, so th that does uh, come with additional impacts. As one can expect, it also ex extends your footprint. So for example, here's just a alignment. If we weren't playing at Crossroad, then we wouldn't have all this impact uh, going up and over. Um, we also have access roads that also expand the footprint um, as we have identified more and more working with the uh, Farm Bureaus for landline parcels. So here's an example of just you know how trying to find differing alignments. Here's one that was actually I believe in Will Township, um, where we we moved the section line. Um, right now, Tier One ended up right in the middle of several farm uh, parcels, so we moved it to the south and expanded our, our our study from there, trying to follow more and more of the section lines to reduce the farm severances. So in order to to try to put this together. Um, we ended up coming up with just a series of sections and we, we did get a comment this morning to, to move this section to match a section line. But we came up with about 12 different sections that either geographically it made sense or it was a, a major piece like section three is from I-55 to 53, 53 to about the town of Simmerton, uh, Simmerton over to about uh, Center. Wilton Center um, and then Wilton Center over so we ended up just putting it into sections in order to try to come up with differing alignments through I was going to try to walk through the sections real quickly just to give you an example and then really walk with what what we're going to try to advance forward um, uh, that's a tier one tier two comparison yeah. but I, I we do want to note that in tier one we're we're, we're about 15 percent uh, increase in size of the corridor itself uh, that mainly comes with interchange locations. We've added two more interchanges that were not part of Tier 1, for example. We've added, uh, I don't even know how many. The crossroads were not even included in Tier 1, so any time we have, keep a road open, it adds a little bit of acreage to the Yeah, I can't remember how much percentage-wise we opened yeah. compared to Tier, tier 1. <coughs> uh, so the wetlands, we did see a little uh, less wetlands being impacted, but overall, with the increase of 15%, we are seeing a little bit more impacts than what we had anticipated in Tier 1. Um, the displacements total, that's the number of buildings, um, and we're a little lower than what we had, um, depending on the alignments. Uh, some of the alignments are more properties being impacted, uh, but for example, there would be a, a wetland save. Um, so there is some trade-offs with all the alignments that we have, that's why we have a range here. Um, in general, we're running the numbers now, but it's somewhere in the 40s, I think, uh, for total, uh, it would be displacements of, of residents, because uh, a lot of the buildings here have about four or five uh, buildings on them. Uh, so, section one was Lorenzo, uh, where uh, <coughs> part of the public meeting was the incorporation of the study at Lorenzo Road. What happened was, was we had a ongoing phase one study at Wilmington uh, to replace the 129 structure that's currently shut down in Wilmington right now. 
and so we had to replace it. Well, there's uh, the projections in that area are quite substantial as far as the amount of traffic that's going to use 129. There's a 3,000 acre development right next to it. It's a ridge development. That's what they're currently building out there now. Uh, so when we look to replace 129, it, part of that study we had three public meetings, and we needed uh, really a system, almost a system to system interchange in order to handle it. What came out of those three public meetings was to expand Lorenzo Road interchange and then put a system to system interchange at 129. What we're advancing forward as part of this section is really a, a, a carryover from that environmental assessment that we had there to expand Lorenzo Road and then put a system to system interchange at 129. But when we when the Ileana wound up at 129, we ended up that's how we ended up just carrying into Lorenzo, kind of, it's basically, it's from where it ended up. So we pretty much engulfed that Wilmington study, and so right now all of the impacts associated with Lorenzo and 129 are now being reported out in our environmental impact statement. So section one is just an inverted uh, Lorenzo road, which was alternative uh, C5, and part of that study we just inverted it to 5C uh, to match our naming convention. Um, so for I-55 and 129, we looked at approximately about six different uh, uh, alternatives being advanced forward for a system-to-system -system interchange at I-55 at uh, um, Ileana, um, ultimately looking at two being advanced forward. Uh, one is a diverging diamond interchange in order to handle the amount of projected truck traffic that is coming out of that facility. Um, and a regular diamond interchange, which is going to be um, placed in the middle of where loop ramps are going to come from, not loop ramps, but flyovers are going to come <coughs> from the Ileana to I-55. I don't know if we have an aerial. Oh, we have the... Oh, this is the aerial. Yeah, the aerial there. Here's an aerial. Um, the other one would look very similar, except there would be two, two bridge structures here. Uh, this is... There's a... Yeah, there's... Yeah, can you go back one? from the aerial. So this is bridge development. Uh, they currently own a majority of the land. It's about 3,000 some odd acres um, that's currently being developed. So if you drive up I-55, you can see a lot of the um, intermodal or intermodals that's being developed right now. The rail yard is what they're going to do. Yeah, the rail yard. Is, they put the double tracks in last year, and now they're going to start putting the rail yards uh, right now. So what was happening with that, that 129 is currently closed right now. Um, and it's, it's, we have uh, identified about 60 million in the program just for these two um, interchanges and it's kind of being uh, kind of wrapped into our study. So one of the reasons why we propose a system to system interchange here with 129 in the middle is because of the future development that, that is currently occurring uh, in this area. So the section, this was a very difficult section. Um, we looked at about six different alternatives through the I-55 to uh, 50. Uh, it's about to the railroad tracks, just right before 53. Uh, there's a lot of things going on here. You have Bobcat Field, which is a uh, uh, city of Wilmington owns it, uh, but it's privately run. You have to pay uh, to pl uh, play football there. And then you also have a, a big wetland complex right to the south here. You have a few historic properties, including uh, um, Lynette, Lynette Summer Home, and two more that were um, not deemed potentially eligible, but uh, City of uh, Wilmington uh, historical uh, person has, has requested us to really look at those properties. Um, and then there's also a lot of other things with design exceptions coming out there. Uh, we ultimately looked at six alternatives. We're recommending three to be advanced forward in this section. Um, oh, this just kind of says what they are. But, um, I don't have the, the final footprint, but there's the, the purple 3F. That's one that we're looking to advance forward. We do show uh, some uh, residential impacts uh, now on the east side, actually with that's with 3B. 3F is on the very north one. We're not recommending 3F, right? Yeah, yeah, 3F, yeah. 3F, 3F well, 3A, and 3B. That drawing is wrong because it, it, they all connect down, well, the, the purple one connects down where the yellow one does now. Yeah. 
Yes. So the drawing is like, like a day old. So yes. <laughs> so changes. I just this is a prime example of how complicated this is actually getting, and this paper is getting. Uh, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to weave our way through and, and trying to come up with the least impactive section. So we've done several iterations over numerous sections like this to try to come up with the, the least impacting alternative. Um, what we've done here is we've come up with three of them, but there's trade-offs with every single one. There's trade-offs with everything we do. Um, but 3A, we look to uh, uh, carry forward, but that impacts that bobcat field. Uh, and it also impacted a, a very large wetland complex. Uh, 3B, it shifts to the north, it avoids the, the wetland complex, but we saw uh, more impacts to residential properties. Uh, and it does avoid bobcat field. And then 3F, which was like a hybrid between the two, it avoids the wetlands, bobcat field, IDNR, and it, it kind of minimizes some of the residential properties. All the other ones that you kind of saw there had uh, numerous design exceptions. We'd have to uh, go to, you know, we, we eventually were, were, were getting down to starting to lower the speed limit in order to get through some of those curves in order to avoid some of the, some of the impacts that we were having. 53 interchange, uh, this is probably the area that has just quite a bit being advanced forward. Uh, we have a park flow design. We actually have, do you have the whole range on the next slide? Uh, yeah. yeah. So total at 53, um, this is the section four. Uh, we have one at 53, we have three at or near Riley being advanced forward, and one at Old Chicago being advanced forward, and a no access at all alternative, meaning that you get access at 129, the next access would be Wilton Center. That's all being advanced forward into the draft EIS. So you can see multiple iterations of what's being advanced forward. Um, and so 53, it is on the National Register for Historic Places. It's Historic Route 66. There's been a lot of interest as far as trying to move this uh, from the existing 53 interchange. Uh, the impacts associated with 53 interchanges, we're able to pick up a lot of traffic on Ileana, but we're also increasing uh, modestly the, uh, the uh, traffic along 53. Um, as we relocate that further away from Riley, uh, or further away from 53 over to Riley, we do see some traffic um, dissipating, uh, going the way of where it goes now, uh, mainly from the, the center point area up north. This whole area, though, is all slated for development. Uh, cold storage just went in here. They do about 1,800 trucks a day. Um, and then, so this is all pro logistics park. Uh, so most of this is industrial land uses in this area. So a lot of the traffic, as we move it further away from 53, just uses Arsenal and Wilmington Piatone like it does today. Uh, but we're advancing all of them forward to really look at the impacts of that. So Riley, um, some things are happening at Riley. Uh, there is a, 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 a farm uh, stead in this corner that we were looking to avoid, um, primarily by relocating it a little bit in between. Uh, there's also a park low design that would also uh, uh, try to avoid some of the impacts of the farms that. Uh, we did look at an interchange option at Indian Trail, uh, but that ultimately was dismissed because that's where there's a lot of residential impacts there. At Old Chicago, um, the Cavanaugh property up on this corner, um, it's not, Again, it's not potentially eligible by our state records, but by the city's records, they, they do uh, look at that property that they would like us to save that. Uh, so being on one corner, we have the Cavanaugh property, and on the other corner, we have IDNR's, or Mendeowin's property. If we did originally propose a diamond interchange here, but to expand it, uh, we'd be running into issues with either Mendeowin or the historical uh, property. So we ended up going with a park low design, or a split diamond. So it comes off here, comes back on, and then you'll have two ramps like right here going back up to Arsenal, uh, which was designed for a five-lane facility eventually. That's owned by the city of Wilmington. Um, so this is actually just a couple of renderings of that. So here's the park low design at 53. Here is the... Uh, uh, diamond interchange at Riley that would have a, a farmstead being impacted. We advanced forward two other ones. Uh, this was a split one. 
to retain the farmstead uh, right at Riley. And here's one just shifting the whole thing over. And then here's the part low design. Here's the Cavanaugh property. Uh, this is where you get on and off going east. So that's being advanced forward too. Um, so the 53 interchange is being advanced forward or none at all throughout that whole area. And then your next, from 129, your next uh, exit would, and entrance would be Wilton Center. Uh, for 5A, which is or the Section 5, which is north of Wilmington, we are recommending only one uh, alignment being advanced forward. Uh, that's due to, uh, we had the alignment just north of Simmerton, and with the power lines, the, the Old Glacier Trail, uh, how we were crossing some of the, the creeks in the area, uh, we started realizing pretty quickly that if we moved it a little bit more north, uh, we were able to avoid a lot of that. Uh, so then we further developed that. Uh, that particular alignment. Uh, this is a very interesting area. This is Wilton Center, Section 6. Uh, we've, we've looked at two alternatives that we're advancing forward. One stays within the 2,000 foot footprint. We worked with a number of property owners within this area, um, ultimately creating what, what, is, what is called Alternative 6B. It follows the section lines a lot better. Um, it has a lot better angles. Uh, on the streams themselves. The only issue with alternative 6B is it does go outside the 2,000 foot corridor uh, that we originally had uh, identified in tier one. Um, but uh, as with the record of decision, we did note that there, there may be instances where we do need to work outside the 2,000 foot corridor. Um, so for this particular alignment, um, we are advancing forward both of them both the light yellow in the background, if you can see it, and then also the, uh, the, um, the dark purple here. So uh, this, the dark purple does also avoid impacts to, uh, like I said, it mentions, it gets a lot more, it goes along section lines a lot better. Uh, one of the issues we're having, and that we're gonna continue to work with uh, uh, residents on, is, um, and this is no longer deemed potentially eligible, but uh, there's some properties over in this area that will be landlocked. Um, Fort Creek, this is Fort Creek, right? Does that recall? Where's 128? Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you, you want to go further uh, west there, because that's, uh, you know, 128 is the road that angles. Oh, this is Fort Creek, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Fort Creek. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is, is that there's a a lot of landlocked parcels over here. We're looking at a frontage road, um, but I don't know if we can get across Fort Creek. Uh, that seems to be a problem. Uh, but uh, we're going to continue to look at that. Uh, this is Wilton Center Road interchange. Uh, it's being offset uh, to avoid a lot of the creek uh, impacts. Here's an aerial of that. Here's 4552, uh, this is also in section six, it's just a standard diamond interchange. Um, section seven, uh, we're, in, we're, we're looking at one alternative to be advanced forward there. Uh, we looked at uh, maybe about four or five different interchange options at I-57, uh, trying to find the balance there, uh, and ultimately we went with the lighter yellow alternative. What that did was that avoided the Piatone Township building, Heck Farm, um, some other uh, uh, notable features such as uh, creek crossings. Um, there's also uh, actually the there's a really good wetland complex along 50, just on the other side of the, just tracks. On the, other side of the tracks at 50 that we're also avoiding this alignment. Um, this particular area, um, so now we're starting to get into. This, this township. Uh, we look to uh, shift it a little little north uh, for 7A. It reduces a lot of the impacts of the power lines that would have to be relocated. Um, and so we are shifting it slightly to the north at this particular section. Here's a aerial view of the system system interchange. Uh, we're looking at a kind of a turbine not, no, this isn't turbine design, but it's flyover, flyover design with a, with a standard cloverleaf 
design on half of it. It's a very odd shape, but it actually works pretty well. Um, and so here's that the Heck Farm. Here's Piatone uh, in the distance right there. Um, township building, Piatone Township buildings right there. That's I-57. Correct. Yes. This is this is I-57 as it exists today. So the Eliana would be flying over it, and then we also have a, a couple flyover loop ramps uh, to, to maintain, uh, I think, 45, or is it 55? Uh, 45. I think it's 45 at this. We had to, to kind of come up with some design exceptions to avoid some impacts. So will, will there be an interchange at 45? Yes. 45. Yeah, we will. 45. The, yeah. only, the only one that we're um, not advancing an interchange at all and including a no build alternative for an interchange forward would be at 53. The rest, we're advancing forward an interchange at Wilton Center. We're advancing an interchange forward at 45 and the next one I was going to get to is Illinois 50. So Illinois 50, we're advancing forward this uh, as the interchange design at Illinois 50. Um, what we tried to do, we looked at a number of different options in order to try to make this work. Um, and what happened on this particular side was you had Kennedy Road coming in. So we tried to avoid impacts to, um, well, there's uh, the, the, the bar in the corner here, but um, there's also a large farmstead in this area. So we were looking to pretty much match this, this up. So you'd have it come back here to 50. Well, the issue with that is I had Kennedy Road, so I either had to dead end Kennedy Road, or I'd have to take Kennedy Road around which would have uh, a lot of impacts to the, to the farm side there. So what we did was we just kind of came up with a very similar design that we saw in Arsenal uh, to avoid impacts along the, the farmland here, along the, uh, we, we saw uh, minimal impact to that, to that bar. Uh, so that we found that this was probably the least impact of design. Uh, so we're just recommending this to be carried forward. And so we are recommending an interchange at 50 to be carried forward. Um, section 8, we'll center to Cottage Grove. Um, we have uh, two differing alignments being advanced forward. Um, this is actually, we're, not, we're no longer advancing forward an interchange in Ashland. Uh, we did study that as far as compatibility with Route 1, um, but we are looking to advance forward just uh, two differing alignments. In, in this, uh, very, just very uh, slight uh, difference in both of them. One follows the section lines a little bit better. Yeah, the EPA has this if we get rid of one. <laughs> the one that doesn't follow the section lines. Um, here's the Route 1. Here's a rendering of what it would look like. Uh, it's a standard uh, diamond interchange uh, at Route 1. Uh, Meacher is just to the north there. Um, 9A and 9B, this is uh, getting into, we're just at the border here in Indiana. Um, 9 follows the prim primarily the same one, but there's a fairly large wetland complex that's located right here near the tracks, right here. So we're advancing another alternative to move the interchanges to the south to avoid the wetland. Yeah, yeah we're in Indiana now. With this one. Yeah, this is right at 41. So there's a an interchange, a conceptual interchange at 41 uh, with the relocated frontage road is what it'll look like. And then uh, around 10, uh, this is just south of the dam there. There's another variation of footprints. We have two footprints being buried there. One impacts a more forested area. And this is wetlands and forested area. This has less forested area, but about the same one. It's just a little bit more wetlands. Yeah. A little bit more wetlands. So, so it's just to kind of narrow the footprint there. Yeah, it's kind of a, a trade-off between wetlands and forested areas on that one. Um, one interchange alternative is being recommended for in uh, uh, Indiana 55. Um, Diamond. Yeah. So it's just like yellow being advanced forward. We did look at other options. Ultimately, doing the light yellow. To be <coughs> the conceptual 
55. And then I-65, we actually have three alignments being advanced forward, um, all reducing the forest that impacts on the other side over on this uh, corridor in this area. Um, and impacts the existing overpass at 153rd Street. Um, but we are advancing forward three different interchange uh, areas at I-65. Here's a rendering of what the I-65 interchange will look like. <coughs> okay, local road connectivity, overpasses and underpasses. Um, we have met uh, with a, a, a number of uh, municipalities, uh, emergency and school routes, uh, landowner um, access issues that, have, that we continue to coordinate and work on, uh, future land use coordinated uh, extensively with, with all those agencies. Um, it's a very small chart, you can, uh, but what we're looking to do is a lot of them are, are open. Um, I guess I'll just, uh, I don't know, is there the overall slide? I, I can either go through all of them if you want. Well, I, I had the ones that we added and I have the ones in Will Township on here. Yeah, let's just go through those maybe. But uh, we've added a, a few more. Right now we're, we're recommending these to be advanced since the last public meeting. Uh, 17th Avenue, Martin Long, that's a new one. Gauger, I think that was shown at the last public meeting. 128th, Kedzie, Cottage Grove. Um, those are being looked to be advanced forward. We're still looking at a couple of them, but uh, right now here's Will Township and how it stands today. Um, so we'd like to get maybe some feedback, but uh, Drexler open, Ridgeland closed, Egyptian Trail closed, Will Center open, Crawford closed, Kedzie open, Western closed, and Ashland open. Um, we were looking at Egyptian Trail. We did find out that Egyptian Trail is going to be closed to the north. Um, that is planned as part of the South Suburban Airport. Okay. Sure. Will Center open. Where are they closed at? Where north or? So well, a little bit of uh, north of Church Road and the ultimate plan for this. The ultimate plan is a little bit north of Church Road. All of these roads will be closed except for Ashley. Church Road. As part of the South Suburban Airport's footprint, uh, the only one remaining out of this entire thing is Ashley. Drexler will be able to do this. Drexler. Well, Drexler is just far enough to the last of it. Drexler and Ashley. Yeah, there's no FFA approval on the airport except for Polk. Allocated 71 mil for another land grab or not? Um, so, potential measures uh, we're getting into the uh, BMPs. Uh, we're working very closely with uh, the Forest Preserve, um, Medeo, and as far as sustainable practices along this corridor. Uh, we, we'd like to implement treatment trains. Uh, we're, we're starting to study this now, even though um, I know that we're, we're looking to really put in a lot of these sustainable features in the preferred chapter. Uh, so what's going to happen is right now we're recommending all of these alternatives to be advanced forward and there's quite a slew of them. Um, we go to the public hearing and we can comment on all of these, on all of these alignments. That's what we're, we're seeking comments on. And then very similar to tier one, we come up with a preferred chapter, we submit the preferred chapter. So sometime uh, between the draft EIS and the FEIS, uh, we, we come up with a preferred chapter and then the uh, we, we talked about BMPs or sustainable features that were going to be incorporated. Uh, there is a possibility that we could recommend a preferred alignment at the hearing. Uh, we have not come to that decision on whether or not we're going to, uh, but that also is a possibility where we would present all of these alignments and then recommend a preferred one. Uh, so that is an option, uh, but we haven't done the analysis yet. So we are going to do that. Well, we wanted to give you an example of really the, the treatment trains and the sustainable features that we have as far as uh, detention basins, riparian restorations, uh, prairie grass restorations. Um, as far as this is an example near Fort Creek uh, where we want to do uh, detention settling basins um, uh, and, and just a lot of containment measures. Uh, we're also doing the hydraulic reports for Fort Creek and we're, we're going to extend it. Uh, in order to uh, make sure that it is a uh, uh, viable wildlife crossing uh, or habitat corridor uh, to make sure that it, it remains open. Um, the department, IDOT, has done a, a, a 
few of these. Uh, we're starting to put in more and more of these. Um, I have a, a couple, uh, I, I have one that we already designed on I-80 that will be implemented um, sometime in the future. Uh, but, uh, and then I, I, we're looking at another location along I-80, but we're starting to get more and more into the, uh, the wildlife crossing, the wildlife habitat, and there is a design for those. In regards to the uh, <coughs> sustainability and environmental impact, um, are they looking at the lighting? Not having lights down the entire length of it? No, oh, the, the lighting... Um, I know it's extremely stable. I know it's starting to carry away with street lights. Well, yeah, we get to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Well, it's pretty like you come down 57, now they have it lit up all the way to the, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, this one does not meet the Dura warrants Dura. for lighting it continuously. Yes, this so. one doesn't meet the warrants lighting it continuously. I can see lighting a bit. We usually light the system to system and the whole thing. Is. So what's what's going to happen is we're looking to release the alternatives to be carried forward technical memorandum. That's going to be uh, quite large, but uh, we, we wanted to be very thorough. We wanted to make sure that we were coming up with all the alignments that we had. Um, make sure that we didn't look at at something even if it was close to the 2,000 foot corridor like that one. Is it better to go outside? And that's what we did. Um, CMAP and NERPC plan update, we're requesting an inclusion uh, into both of them, uh, into their, their plans in the fall of 2013. The release of the draft EIS uh, is uh, scheduled, it's usually 30 days before hearing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 30 days before hearing. Um, there has to be a 30-day comment period. It can be released a little bit. Two know. weeks prior? Yeah. So two weeks prior than two weeks after. It was released Friday. Well. Which one? CMAP. Yes, yeah, there was, no, I'm talking about the draft EIS. CMAP's analysis was released Friday and it's Correct. in the public period, public comment period right now. Yes, that is. Um, the anticipated, um, we were looking to potentially combine the FEIS and ROD uh, that hasn't been decided. MAP 21, just like we did in Tier 1, uh, allows the, the states to, to combine the FAIS and the record of decision. Uh, so we're still looking at early 2014. Um, and then after the record of decision, we would begin the actual land acquisition uh, processes. And then right now, P3 activities are ongoing. And I'll open up to questions. Thank you for sitting through all that. It's kind of awesome.